Hi, my name is Christopher, and behind me is my Oliver 102 pattern mill. On this channel, we'll look at what it does, how it works, what I'm using it for, and how I maintain it. First, let's talk about what a pattern mill is. Referring to the Oliver sales literature, what they say is that it's the most wonderful and most desirable machine for working in wood that has ever been brought to the attention of pattern makers. For convenience and general utility, it has no equal. Its range of usefulness is unlimited. It is to the pattern maker in his department what the universal milling machine, shaper, and drilling machine is to the metal worker and the machine shop. For pattern and core box work, grooving, trenching, jointing, routing, surface work, gear cutting, and general pattern work, such as working out segments of a circle, it has no equal. This mill is very similar to metal milling machines like bridge ports. There's a table that holds the work, a spindle that holds the cutters. In this case, most of the cutters are form tools similar to a wood shape or a router. And here's some things that distinguish this machine from a metal milling machine. First off is the size, it's a 22 foot long bed. The capacity for the work is about 10 feet long, uh, about four feet wide and three feet high. And also the spindle speeds are much higher on this. We're looking for about 6,000 surface feet per minute at the cutter. And so that has, this has a range of 1,380 RPMs up to 4,100 RPMs. And there's also the lead screw, the power lead screw drives the table at up to four feet per minute. The motor that drives the spindle is seven and a half horsepower, and it's fed, it's uh, driven by a flat leather drive belt. Let's look closer at the different components of the mill now. Here we've got the head, which includes the spindle, the vertical travel on the spindle, also includes the vertical travel for the entire head. Uh, that goes up to a counterweight and pulley system. The counterweight is a 750 pound counterweight behind this. Um, you can run this with the power lead screw with a one and a half horse motor up there, or you can uh, adjust this with the hand wheel. One of the reasons for the leather drive belt is to allow the head to both move up and down and also for the spindle to rotate. The leather drive belts behind this canvas cover, which just keeps the uh, wood chips out. See right here, there's a wheel here, another wheel up here. So the motor's down there, the drive belt comes up, turns, rotates, goes past the spindle here, comes back, rotates again, goes up this drive belt to a pulley at the top, an idler, which is also the tension adjustment, goes back down uh, to the motor drive pulley. So then the spindle, uh, the head itself up here, uh, this rotates 95 degrees in each direction. Uh, and then the spindle has uh, about 10 inches of up and down travel. So there's one degree of freedom by moving the entire head up. And that can serve also as a macro adjustment. Um, can turn, run the spindle up and down, which when the head is at 90 degrees, gives you travel perpendicular to the table. Uh, but if you rotate the head, now traveling, the, any travel in the spindle is not perpendicular to the table anymore. So this becomes the only perpendicular axis of travel for the cutter as compared to the table. And so then you can make a compound cut, you can do undercuts. Uh, you can also use it to drill or bore out something. This Oliver came with two tables. There's the standard table, which travels along the bed, also is powered, so that's an x-axis. It rotates, and it has an xy table on top, as well as half 13 clamps or, or um, threaded holes for clamping, um, and these are original clamps that came with it. Uh, when the table is both zero, zero, 
on the x x uh, on the x y axes on this, and zero along the t table bed travel, then this is the center uh, of the rotation when you turn this. You can remove this uh, insert and put in some accessories similar to faceplates. So you could uh, attach one of these to your work before you mount it on here. Um, and then there's also some that are more like a plug, so you can ha have a hole to receive that plug on your workpiece to orient it. When you run this out along the uh, bed travel, then that will become now a radius from the center of the spindle. The other, uh, the other table that this machine came with is this, uh, with an accessory table, which is just a rotate table. I find it very handy to have the two. Um, one thing you can do with the two is to have your 10 foot long piece on the machine. Another thing is that this is great for just making round pieces. A lot of work that I do is on the lathe and I make very large turnings, sometimes several hundred pounds and three feet or so in diameter. So I actually do the rough turning on this table and then take it over to the lathe and it's already centered and rough turned for my lathe because I can align a faceplate to this. Um, both of these tables work with the, uh, the bed lead screw powered travel. Here it is at the low setting, and which is two and a half feet per minute. And this is now the high speed, which is four and a half feet per minute. I don't usually have the controls on the bed. We'll look at that a little bit later, why they're here and where I usually have them. And so you've seen the bed travel, the power lead screw. It's a three horsepower, two speed motor. And then there's also the power travel for the head. It goes up and down. And that still has another six inches of travel left to go. Um, and then there's the the spindle. It says forward and reverse, which is great for uh, the grain of the wood and the type of cutter, which side is sharpened. Um, so you select that and then it's four speed. So this is the low speed at 1300 RPMs. And so on, that's up to four speeds. So here's the control panel. Originally, this would have been up in the air, and here's a picture showing a machine with it as it was originally installed, and this machine too. You can see in the video that's playing that it can be a little bit tricky to actually reach the controls while you've got work mounted on the machine. Also, when I bought the machine, the stock that it was on was broken and, and needed to be repaired. So I could have put the money and effort into repairing that. Um, instead, I chose to add a, an armored cable the, uh, and a control an interface with the old wires on a box, a new box on the back of the machine. What this does, I think it's, it's safer because I don't need to be up close to the cutter or the work to hit stop or to change speeds, to, to change the table feeds, any of those things. So I've now got it mounted remotely and I have a, a cart, a Harbor Freight cart that I got that works perfectly and uh, you'll see it, uh, what that looks like in a minute. But to walk you through what these controls are, this is the raise and lower for the arm um, and the head. This is a, uh, an overall stop just for the motor. And these are the motor controls. There's a stop here, a forward and reverse. Uh, there's also another stop here, and these are the speeds, one through four. And this is, again, the stop for the motor. Really, these three stops are very similar in how they work. Uh, you can turn this to safe so you can't 
possibly start the motor accidentally. Uh, this doesn't stop the table feed or the arm feed. The arm feed only moves up and down. These are momentary buttons, so as long as you're pressing it. Uh, the table feed, though, disconnect the drive uh, where you just select the direction. So you've got stop, and you've got low, and you've got high for the tables. Feed speeds, and that's this is two feet per minute, and this is four feet per minute. Let's look a little closer at this very important area for the machine here. Uh, this is in neutral right now. This is the lever to select the gear uh, for whether you drive the table to the left or to the right. And there's also a lock and a detent stop for the rotation of this table. You can uh, move the table manually doing using this uh, hand wheel. Uh, you have to lock this, otherwise, where, to use the, the power feed, otherwise the handle will just spin and the table will stay there. And then on top here, we've got above the rotation part, we've got this an XY set of tables. So move back and forth, left and right, and some scales with some zero marks. There are a few more areas that you can adjust on this machine. Both of the tables on uh, both ends of the center section can be removed. Uh, they can be removed so that you can turn this table. Uh, you can turn it more, much more easily. Uh, by having them on, it gives you a longer travel distance. Uh, for that rotary table, or even this table, you could have it on the accessory tables. You could take the tables off, put them on the other side of the room, and cut an arc uh, only limited by the size of the building that this machine is in, really, and some other practical considerations. But um, imagination, the sky's the limit. And here's some pictures of it being used cutting much bigger pieces from uh, Oliver Sales literature. So this table rotates. Uh, the scale down here it rotates 360 degrees. That allows you to have a com compound relationship with the table and the, uh, the head rotation um, as compared to the work. And here's some pictures from the original sales literature showing different things being cut like gears. Make it a little bit easier for myself to demonstrate the spindle adjustment here. So there's about nine inches of travel, 10 inches of travel, and each revolution is a half inch. So that's a quarter inch half turn. I usually feed using a three inch diameter cutter from just roughing wood out, um, feed down a quarter to a half inch per pass, and then advance the table, um, usually an inch and a half or so. So I'm taking about a half inch deep cut and an inch and a half wide. This is where I keep the cutters and accessories. So in here, these are most of the cutters. There's rounds. Uh, so this is a five and a quarter inch cutter. This I've uh, flattened on a surface grinder, a tool and uh, cutter grinder. Also sharpen the edge. Um, some look like they've never been used or sharpened, which is great. And uh, I believe these were consumable items. For one thing, if you're sharpening a five and an eighth inch radius on this, which that's what this cutter is, Eventually, you'll run out of material. And uh, also, sometimes tools were modified. In this case, they ground half of the cutter off, the cutter edge. Uh, yeah, that could be so that um, the cutter was only passing the wood in one direction, 
Uh, it also uh, makes sharpening it a little easier. Uh, at the same time, it means uh, perhaps you have effectively less cuts per revolution. In this case, we see a outside radius where the bevels are aligned so that they cut um, the same direction as opposed to this where they cut in opposite directions. Uh, this one I've also cleaned up on a tool and cutter grinder. Uh, I flattened the back with the theory that uh, just like sharpening a plain iron, that your cutting edge is only as good as, as the surface on the back is. Um, here there's some old grinder marks. Um, they're fairly deep. Uh, so I clean it up and then um, this one I sharpened by hand and I'm working to uh, have a good system with my tool and cutter grinder to cut a, a radius on that so I don't have to do it by hand any longer. But here's the half rounds. Uh, some of these, they, they go on different, uh, they're both different thicknesses and use different uh, cutter holders to go in the spindle. I'll show you the cutter holders in a minute. Um, these very small ones uh, go on a totally different type of cutter. I'll show you those, but generally these just stick down in the spindle and rotate. These do something a little different. Um, here's some square cutters, or these have a, a relief on the inside. This is totally square. This has uh, a radius on the inside. These are for angles. I don't know what that's for. Um, these would be for a taper, which might uh, yeah, for mold making is important. Uh, these are the different uh, bolts to attach these. Um, these are the outside uh, radius ones. For the larger uh, radius cutters, this is a 10 and a half inch cutter. That actually comes in two pieces. So you cut uh, you know, each portion of the 10 and a half inch radius with a separate cutter. Here's some uh, cutter holders. So they're a number four Morse taper uh, that goes into the spindle. These are some of the long ones. Uh, there's a half inch um, draw bar. This is a face plate that goes in the table I was talking about earlier. So you can attach, either attach this to the work and drop it in the table and then you'll know that it's exactly centered and calibrated with all the scales on the machine, or you can cut this uh, uh, a, pl a, a hole in the piece you're um, taking to the machine, use that to line this up, as opposed to screwing it in, and, uh, and then use some sort of clamping on the table to hold it in place, depending on what you're doing. It's just very versatile. Uh, a little auger bit, probably an inch and a half or so. Um, for the longest uh, cutters, there are these um, bronze, uh, these bronze bearings that act as a support. So when this is in the machine, mounted in the spindle up here, you can put this in place. There's a little offset clamp here, and then you put a, a steel rod back into the machine here, and that will. Um, if you're cutting in this, if the cutter is moving in this direction, it will back this up so it won't deflect. I have not used any of these yet. These are some of the really fun ones. There's a big uh, trenching cutter that goes from about three inches to six inches, and uh, you rotate these out, and that could basically do um, a rabbit or dado. Uh, this is for the, um, this is what I just showed, those bronze pieces that back up the uh, cutter attachments. Um, this isn't an Oliver piece, but that can definitely be used on the Oliver. Uh, I got a chuck um, that I supplied, a number four Morse taper chuck. That's great. This holds some of these larger cutters, um, slides into here. And this is brass and I assume it's brass, so it's less likely to break and explode and cause mayhem. If something does happen, it's more malleable. 
And for the bigger cutters, uh, you use this one and instead of a uh, Morse taper, this slides over the end of the spindle and clamps onto the outside of the spindle. And this is a three inch inside diameter. Uh, you can put whatever you want on this guy. Uh, this type of cutter, all of these, uh, goes into the machine with this, um, with this adapter. It goes on to the end of this. And then you put these cutters and holders inside of this. You attach some of these smaller ones. So then now this is turning around, sweeping you know, up to about a 18-inch um, diameter circle that you can cut on this. So you can cut an 18-inch diameter hollow with this guy. Um, and that would be for core boxes and things. And generally, you're cutting that 18-inch hollow um, with the head tilted 90 degrees so that it's essentially vertical, the cutter, and taking trenching out work that you're passing past it. Um, some spare parts. Uh, these, I use this in the um, tool and cutter grinder for cutting or for um, sharpening the bits. This is, these are the, uh, this is the last set of uh, cutters or cutter holders. Uh, and these are the ones that I use most often. They're a little bit smaller and, uh, uh, but also more versatile on the, um, in with those cutters. And so this one, uh, the cutters mount off the center of the spindle as opposed to this where they actually are on the center. So with this one, generally you wanna have two cutters on there, or if you only have one, then uh, you, you, you wanna have something else to balance it on the other side, just weight wise. Um, and also because this is off centered, uh, it'll definitely affect the profile. So most of the uh, radius cutting tools you'd wanna to have mounted um, centered on the spindle. Uh, and then if you mount them off center, gotta do the math, um, know what you're up to because you might not get what you expect. And so this is just the last few accessories. This is a three and a half inch planer head. This is very cool, um, by about six inches. Uh, it's unusual in that uh, the end is sharpened as well. It's like a rebate cutter for a um, shaper, a uh, wood shaper. This is a three inch, Diameter auger. Uh, I love the machining marks on this. Very cool. Uh, this is a little guard um, that you can use to cover the bit. I haven't used that. There's definitely been times I've wanted to. Um, I almost wonder if it's more dangerous to use that uh, for a couple of reasons. You could crash the work into it and then have this go into the cutter. Um, that would be, I, I wouldn't want that to happen. Um, also, not being able to see the cutter, uh, that I, I'd be a little worried about that as well. Leave comments if you think I should use the guard. But definitely in a video, show how to put that on, what that looks like. And this last guy is insanely heavy. And this last guy, is an offset uh, head for the mill. So if you turn the spindle 90 degrees, so it's horizontal, put this on, uh, you attach it to the spindle down here. And so this would be vertical, and now you've got an offset head. So the access to the, 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 the center of the spindle is right here on the, on the machine. So when you put this on, what you can do is now take a cut below the head with the center of the cutter below the head of the machine. And so what this allows you to do is to trench out, um, take the half round out of a large 
piece of wood that's generally called a core box. Um, look it up. But in here, you can put in those, those fly cutters that extend out and you can use it in those go up to a good 18 inches just from what I have. You could definitely make bigger ones, but you would be limited by um, when they rotate the clearance here. And as well, this will take on any number of um, accessories. And I don't, I have the cutters, but I don't have the discs. And you can see here what those discs look like. That's up to a three foot diameter cutter on this. Um, you can change out the pulley on the, uh, on the motor. I have that pulley, which halves the spindle speed. But with that three foot cutter, you're either at 1300 RPMs or 16 or 600 and, and 50 or so. Um, and that, that's, that, that'd be scary too. Well, thanks for watching this introductory video.